welcome to WOJC Ministry. Last week I started a series on the eternal security of the believer in Christ Jesus and whether it was conditional or unconditional. I showed lots of scriptures about our security and why we need a Savior to cover our sins and give us right standing back with God the Father. We are all sinners and all fall short of the glory of God. Christ had to go to the cross for us because although God's law was perfect, we could not keep that law. Man was not perfect. I showed in scripture where, where it would be impossible for us to have anything to do with keeping our salvation, thus making it unconditional. This week, I'm going to continue the study. So let's jump into the scripture and read more about what the word of Christ tells us. Let's get into some meat. Matthew chapter 23 verses 16 and 17. Woe unto you blind guides which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whoso shall swear by the gold of the temple, he's a debtor. You fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? The temple that sanctifies the gold. That's the, the key there. To sanctify is to make holy. And the gold has no holiness but what it derived from the temple. If the gold was in any other place, it would be no more holier than any other gold. It was ridiculous to think that the gold was more holier than the temple itself, from which it received all of the sanctity which it possessed. So Pharisees want to say that they have something to do with their salvation. They're making themselves sanctified. They're making themselves holy. You know, we're, we're all the gold. But the Pharisees make themselves as gold holy. And they sanctify themselves. And what Christ is telling them is that it's not the gold that is sanctified. And it's not the gold that sanctifies itself but the temple that sanctifies the gold. It's not you that sanctifies yourself through all of your works and your deeds, but Christ, the temple, who sanctifies you. The gold cannot sanctify itself. The issue is that the Pharisees were swearing by the gold because they saw it as more precious in their sight. But in fact, the temple and altar were dedicated to God himself, and the gold was only secondary. Listen to what Hebrews says, Hebrews 7, 7. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. So you see, it's not the gold or ourselves that sanctify ourselves as we are only secondary. It's Jesus Christ that sanctifies us and not that of ourselves. Again, when you add Jesus plus something else, you will become a Pharisee. If you put your works into the picture or in place of Christ's righteousness for justification and sanctification, then you are being guilty of what the Pharisees did in Jesus' day and have put yourself above Christ, as now it's you that truly sanctify yourself, making Christ the secondary or the lesser and you the primary and the better. Listen to what Luke says. Luke 11:52, Woe unto you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering, you hindered. The scribes and Pharisees, through their false doctrine and hypocritical lives, keep others from entering into the kingdom of God. That is, they acted as the human instruments to block the true way into heaven. And this is exactly what is happening when someone bases their salvation on works and teaches the same thing, hindering someone from obtaining the key of knowledge, thus keeping them from entering into eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The person believing this does not enter themselves as well as the others they have falsely taught. Thus why the word says, and them that were entering in you hindered. It's false teachers that will try to make the gold holier than the temple, or more important than the temple. 
as false teachers that want to sanctify themselves the lesser rather than accepting Christ's sanctification the better. So to teach others that they too must, must sanctify themselves instead of accepting what Christ accomplished on the cross, this is a hindrance and Christ said woe unto you. He called them blind guides. When you have the blind leading the blind, then all you're going to produce are more blind people who will do the same. I think we need to always be standing up for the Word of God, no matter what. When we hear these teachings, we need to make sure that we at least speak up for the truth, regardless of if they want to understand the truth or not. I mean, if you're around others and hear this teaching, then I think we're responsible to show in Scripture that they're not teaching it correctly, so that those around listening will not be fooled by these blind guides. And I'm not saying to interrupt church services or anything like that. There's always a way to deal with these situations, but always allow the Holy Spirit to guide you in these situations. All right, moving on. Jude chapter 1 verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. Many children of God today have been raised with the knowledge that it's not walking in love when you correct another person or if you reprove them. They're taught that it's just judging and we're not to judge anyone. And this is not scriptural as we just read. We should earnestly contend for the faith. But with this said, if someone's new to the faith or someone's seeking the truth, then we should by all means walk in love, showing them scripture and leading them to the knowledge of the truth. At some point, however, there will be the wolves and sheep clothings that come in that try and deliberately lead the flock away. And that's what I'm referring to. These wolves will come in and devour the sheep if we're not careful. And I think we have a responsibility, especially as pastors, teachers, evangelists, that we expose these wolves so the sheep will not be devoured and led astray into a different doctrine. And I bring this all up because it's so important for the teaching of eternal security. It goes right with it because if you add Jesus plus something you're becoming a Pharisee so I think it's important that we speak up and that we bring this to light what does the Bible tell us about false teachers and those that do not believe in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ but yet try and twist the words to lead them astray and that's what many of these people are doing Ephesians chapter 5 verse 11 have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So I, I think it's evident that we are to stand up and be firm in our faith and challenge others who refuse to listen, learn, and believe in the Word of God. But with all this, keep in mind, we don't know what the person's heart is until we take the time to hear them. And uh, they could come in and say much false doctrine, but they just might be unlearned or confused and still be a child of God. So it's vital that we walk in love with people. And I'm stressing this because a godly example out of love will be much more effective in reaching them than a judgmental attitude. Again, with this being said, always be open to the leading of God's Spirit, whether it's a brother in Christ or a false teacher that is deliberately trying to mislead you or somebody else. So, um, let's jump in some more word. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, our inheritance is, and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for us. We have a reservation, amen. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And here we're talking about our security again. When sin occurred in the garden, we were at that point separated from God. But scripture tells us that God has begotten us again by Christ's resurrection from the dead. Our inheritance that will never fade away and reserved for those who are kept by the power of God through our faith, which saves us. How can we think that we have anything to do with this? 
if it's God who says that he keeps us through his power, then tell me how arrogant it is to believe it's our power that will get us this incorruptible inheritance. It's his power that does it, not ours. In and of ourselves, we will never ever have the power to keep ourselves. John chapter 6, 37 through 39. All that the Father has given me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again in the last day. So here you have it, folks. To those who believe that you can throw your salvation away because God gave you a gift and you now somehow have an ability to get that gift back or throw it in the trash, this one's for you. I told you we're going to get into some meat. The fact remains is that Christ will never ever lose one single person that comes to him with a repentant heart and accepts him as their Lord and Savior. This is what the word of Christ says himself. Christ will in no way cast any of us out if we have accepted him as Lord and Savior. God sent Christ to the world and Christ himself says that all which God gives him, he should lose nothing but raise it up in the last day. How is it not eternal? This is straight from the horse's mouth. Christ. That's why it's written in red. The fact remains is that if someone claims to be a child of God but yet they live like the devil, or if they somehow just decide that they no longer believe, then the fact is is they never truly believed to begin with. Because God will never ever lose anyone or anything that, has give, that God has given him. And that is all those who have accepted him with the true heart. If you can throw your gift away, then you never truly had the gift. It is a fake gift. I know this is pretty rough here, but it's the truth. See, Satan has a counterfeit for everything that God does. If there is a free gift of eternal security, then there is a counterfeit. And I guarantee you that if you think you can throw God's gift away, then you have not truly received the real deal but a fake gift and a lie that the devil has made you believe. Open your eyes in the name of Jesus and receive the real deal. Jesus Christ is the real deal, and what he has done is eternal, and he will not lose a single soul that has come to him. I am not saying this. We have just read the words of Christ right here in Scripture. He will not lose a single soul. And Christ even restates what he said just a few verses down in John, in verse uh, 44, chapter 6. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will rise or raise him up in that last day. See, if you receive the gift, Christ doesn't say that he will possibly raise you up if he feels like it or if you've been good enough. He didn't say that he might raise you up if you don't do all of these works and you sanctify yourself and make yourself so holy and so perfect. No, he specifically states that he will raise him up in the last day. And this is some meat that we're chewing on. It needs to be discussed, it needs to be taught, and it needs to be given to the world. Let's keep going. We have a lot to discuss. Titus. Chapter 1 and 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So if God promised this before the world began, then why are some striving so hard to per perfect themselves by their own works in order to sanctify themselves, to be holy enough to receive God's eternal life? I mean, right here it says that God cannot lie. When we accept him, then we have a blessed hope and future in his presence forever. Yes, we sanctify ourselves every day. It's a sanctification process, but we are ultimately sanctified through the blood of Jesus Christ. As the Bible says, he that does righteousness is righteous. So that means we have a part to play. I'm not condoning sin. I'm not saying sin's okay. It's not okay to sin. Stop sinning. But we are righteous through 
Jesus Christ. We've been imputed that righteousness. So many people think they have to do this and do that and work and make themselves holy or they're not saved. That's the problem. They think they can lose their salvation or they think they have to work for their salvation, which is the whole issue. We will never be able to work to keep our salvation. It's impossible. And I think scripture up to this point proves it. But we're not done yet, guys. There's more. Romans chapter 622. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Yep, there's some more goodies. The end, everlasting life. Why? Because we become the servants of God, being made free from our sins. Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which has beget a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Being confident. How? How can we be confident? I mean... If I've got to work and, and I, I'm scared that I could do something to lose my salvation, then how, how can I even be confident? The fact is, is we can be confident because what Christ has done on the cross. Knowing that it's not Jesus plus going to church. It's not Jesus plus the traditions of men. It's not Jesus plus what we tend to think that we must do in our carnal mind but to trust and fully place our spiritual well-being in Christ Jesus alone. That's what believe means, actually. Um, looking at the Greek word for believe, um, I bring it up because the New Testament was translated from the Greek. So uh, to, to kind of broaden our understanding, let's just look up what that word believe is in the Greek. It is pistol. Pistuo, pistuo, is um, to have faith in or upon with respect to a person or thing. That is credit by implication to entrust, especially one spiritual well-being to Christ. To believe, to commit, to put in with trust. So here we have it. If one has believed in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, for their cleansing of sins, and have truly accepted him as Lord of their lives, then they will, in fact, entrust their spiritual well-being to Jesus Christ, not Jesus Christ plus, but all of it. Either you're a saint or you ain't. It cannot be both, just as with salvation. Either you're saved, you're not, and either it's eternal or it's not. You cannot have both. Christ does not give you a free gift and then take it back. He can't. Romans 11.29, for the gifts and calling to God are without repentance. And some translations say irrevocable in place of without repentance. Why? Because that's what it means in the Greek. It's irrevocable. So if, there, if it's irrevocable, then how can you just throw it away or give it back? Or lose it? You can't. God does not play games. God is not double-minded like it talks about in James. God is not double-minded like we are. Man's double-minded. God's yes is yes. And his yes says that we are given eternal life. James touches on it. James 1.17 Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So we have a security in knowing that God's word and God will never waver in his mind. He will never change like man does. Many of us think because the gospel is so simple that our carnal minds just don't understand it, so we got to add to it. You can be confident before God the Father because he is not subject to mood swings. God does not need antidepressants. God doesn't change like the shadows change or anything, so we can be completely 100% confident and sure of every one of his promises. Hebrews 10.23 let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful 
that is promised. And this is where many get in trouble. They don't hold fast to their profession of faith without wavering. They must do something other than Jesus Christ. Jesus plus something else. So when they do something, or even in their belief that they can lose salvation, then it is not holding fast their profession of faith, because as the verse ends, he is faithful that promised. God is faithful. You know, we might not be faithful as carnal man, but God is. It's not our faithfulness. It's God's faithfulness. Lots of times we try and relate God to earthly man, and we cannot do that. Man will fail you. Man will lie to you. Man will stomp on you and beat you and kick you in the dirt. Man will leave you. Man will hurt you. But God is not a man. He will do none of these. And we need to see this above all else. God is not man. And his ways are higher than ours. And God cannot lie about any of this. What he's written is truth. What he's written is fact. And what he has written, he will do. Hebrews chapter 9 verses 11 through 12. But Christ be, being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect temp tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And again, here we have it, eternal redemption. This means that we have been redeemed yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It's eternal. It's trusting in Jesus Christ alone and in what we are unable to do. And we are unable to save ourselves. We are unable to keep ourselves saved. This was proven with scripture after scripture after scripture. So let's just do a little review. First of all, we're given or offered eternal life. And then we either accept this or not. If we accept, then we're told that he will never leave or forsake us. He gives us the Holy Spirit as a deposit to ensure his promises. And when we get there, we read that he writes our names in the Lamb's Book of Life and keeps a record of them in heaven. And he has promised to never change his mind about anything he has done for us. Christ obtained all of this for us with his shed blood on the cross as our representatives. Just as Aaron was able to enter into the Holy of Holies as the representatives of the nation of Israel and sprinkle blood for the children to atone for their sins. Christ has done this for us as well. See, the children of Israel didn't have to do the work, did they? It was Aaron that had to do the work. And thus it's the same with Christ. Christ did the work. We didn't have to do the work either. Christ has made this blood sacrifice for us. Everything in this life has been paid for through Jesus Christ. We are eternally redeemed. Not just today, or when we sin, but eternal. The trials and tribulations, the ups and downs, the whether I do this or I don't do that, does not affect the fact that we fail, but God never fails. And we have an eternal redemption. We have a representative and the greatest attorney in existence, sitting at the right hand of God the Father, who is constantly making intercession for us. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So Christ came to do the will of God the Father, which was to undo what the first Adam did in the garden. 
Christ is now the second Adam and the last Adam forever. There'll never be another. And this is why the offering of Christ is a once and for all done deal. What we lost from Adam, we now ha have gained through Christ Jesus. And as we've read, that gain is an eternal redemption. And uh, it's further mentioned just a few verses down in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. So at this point, I'm probably going to get some more um, comments or people thinking that we're I'm preaching a license to sin. You know, but you know what? I'm going to touch on that in another video. You know, at, at first I wasn't even going to worry about it, but I hear it so much. So I'm, I'm going to uh, touch on uh, these people that talk about a license to sin, and, and I'll put it in this series. You know, I think that the once saved, always saved is a teaching from hell because of the implications that man has associated with that teaching. But I've said it many, many times, it's not really about once saved, always saved, but about whether one is truly saved or not. But I'm going to get there. And so uh, just keep on listening. We'll get to that once saved, always saved. And uh, this license to sin garbage I hear all the time. It's something that I, I, I just can't overlook it in this series, so I'm going to be discussing it. But nonetheless, Hebrews 10, 14 tells us that even, it tells us again that we are perfected forever if we're sanctified. And it really doesn't get easier than this. And then another few scriptures down in Hebrews 10, verses 16 to 17. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, and I will write them and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. So praise God that he does not hold our sins against us like we hold against the man. You know, um, the reason he doesn't is because of what Christ did on the cross. And we have that imputed righteousness. And what does David tell us in Psalms? 103 verse 12 as far as the east is from the west so far has he removed our transgressions from us so this is simply what what the writer of hebrews is saying most believe it's paul so i'll just keep it at paul hebrews 13 5 let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things that you have for he has said i will never leave you nor forsake you so the writer knew paul knew his sins were removed forever so then he could understand that God would never leave nor forsake him. Just as God will never leave nor forsake us. Never means never. Get it. Never means never. Never. I, I don't know how much plainer the word of God can be. It means nothing more, nothing less. It's never. Get it. You got it? Good. All right, Ephesians 1, 12 and 14. 12 through 14. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted. After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. I love the scripture because it shows that we're saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved. It's an ongoing eternal salvation for those of, that are in Christ Jesus. First, Christ loved us, then we trust in Christ through, our, through the truth of the gospel. And then it says that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And the Spirit now dwells in us, and this is where it gets good. In verse 14 it says that it's the earnest of our inheritance. So let's, let's look up what earnest is in the Greek as well. Earnest is our haraban. These words are hard to pronounce. And I don't even know if they're correct, but um, it's on the screen. So you can do your due diligence and uh, dig and learn yourself. Amen. Our haraban. It means a pledge that is part of the purchased money or property given in advance as security for the rest of it. So, not only are we saved, but we're being saved, and then we also have a future of eternity, 
which God has purchased for those that place their trust in him. He has made a pledge, an oath, and purchased us with his blood. We are now his property and we have been given an advance as a security that we will be with him forever. This is why it's important to understand what Christ did for us on the cross. It is impossible for us to do anything other than Jesus Christ. It is not Jesus plus anything else. We could never in and of ourselves, no matter how much work we accomplished on earth could ever in a gazillion, bazillion, trizillion years ever make it to heaven except only through the blood of Jesus Christ. If we could do this, then there would be no reason for a savior. If we could be so holy and perfect and righteous and good and loving and kindly in and of ourselves, then Jesus would have never have had to go through the cross. Listen, you know, we're not pleasing to God because we do or don't do anything. We are only pleasing to God Almighty through what his only begotten son did on the cross at Calvary. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot keep ourselves saved. And we sure in the world cannot secure us a spot in heaven for eternity by ourselves either. Hebrews 9.22 And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. So although some things were not purged by blood, like the things that needed to be purified with water or, or by fire, there were certain things that had to. The fact remains is that the, the only way sins could be pardoned was by the shedding of the blood. The high priest had to do this once a year for the children of Israel, so Christ came and did it all to those who accept. So without the sacrifice, there'd be no remission for our sins. I know we, we're covering a lot of scriptures, but it's important. I'm doing this for a purpose, but it's also very important. So, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 and 30. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the, the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the believers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So the point is, is that, that we can grieve the Holy Spirit, but it also goes on to say that we are sealed unto the day of redemption. This is just another scripture that gives us the promise of eternal security. We are sealed, we are sanctified, we are holy, we are just, we are righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ, and that is the only thing that is ever gonna get us to heaven. Not our works. Nothing that can break this seal of God. Nothing. Nothing can break the seal of God Almighty. I think I said it last week that if someone can come in or even ourselves, if we think we're power, powerful enough to self to, to break the seal of Almighty God, then he's a weak God. Either we are that powerful and he is a weak, pitiful God, or there's something wrong on our end. And I'll guarantee you it's something wrong on our end because God is not weak. God is God. Okay, uh, another scripture we have here, 2 Timothy 4.18, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> so this is an interesting scripture. Because we know that none of us are righteous and do good in the sight of God. And this was established in the first video. Uh, well, we, we see it in the second, we see it in this video too. Um, as we read this, we need to understand that God's, God isn't going to keep us from free will. We will choose or not choose to do what God wants. I mean, after all, the scripture says that he that knows to do good and doesn't do it to him it's sin, as well as anything outside of faith that is sin. So this means that the scripture would contradict itself if we, if we were to take it as it's worded. We know that the Lord has not delivered us from every evil work. For we live in a fallen world and in a sinful fleshly body. So it is meant here that, the, that in the end God saved us. 
He continues to save us, and in the end, he does deliver. He does save us from every evil work through our death. As uh, the Lord Jesus will bring us safely into the kingdom, the heavenly kingdom, in the end. And this is why it states that he will preserve me until his heavenly kingdom. See, Paul said that Alexander did much evil to him in the previous work. So it's apparent that Paul wasn't delivered from every evil work. So really, this is the only way that we can see it in the scripture. And uh, the point to be noticed, though, is that God will preserve us until we go to our Heavenly Father. This is an eternal preservation. Paul knew his hour was drawing near and that he was going to be killed. As it doesn't say he'd be pres preserved from death, but he was assured that in his death, all of his trials, all of his turmoils, all of his tribulations, all of his sufferings would be all in the past and he would be delivered from them. When he passed from his earthly body and entered into the heavenly kingdom, and we too can have this assurance. And I'm going to cut the video off here. I don't want to make it too long. But we have an awesome, awesome God. And he has given us the greatest gift in, in the history of our world. In the history of existence, in my opinion. The greatest gift. And that gift is eternal life. It's disheartening when I hear people say that it's grace plus works. And I understand what they're saying, but yet they don't understand what the word says. When you are saved, you're going to have works. And I'm going to discuss all, I'm going to discuss all this later, but I just kind of, I just wanted to end the video on that, that, um, we have a sanctification process. We have a part to play. And, um, like I said, if you're truly, truly saved, you're going to change. You're, you're going to show forth works. And, um, but I'll cut it off here. And I thank you for listening. And if you enjoyed it, please share the video. Please like it. And please subscribe. And uh, God bless everyone at the sound of my voice. And keep the faith.